Paradiso is the uh, ascent through the heavens. And if you read the whole thing, it is a, uh, a, an incredible tour of uh, biblical figures and theologians and uh, people Dante just generally admires. And it's a nice... Uh, it's a nice break from hearing about how how much he hates everybody in Inferno. It's a nice little change of pace to find that, okay, he likes some people. There are certain things in this world that are good. Um, and it leads up to this vision of God. You get a logical ascension through levels of goodness, which again becomes very abstract and very idealistic and hard to really grasp. Um, but ultimately, you get to the vision of God. Now, on my book, line or page 577, right at the very top, it's line like 120 we get another invocation or invocation slash um, declaration of one's own inadequacy as a poet. Now, part of this is what you would call or what has been called ineffability, the natural incapability of the human mind to grasp something of such magnificence. There is a level beyond which human beings simply cannot conceive. Um, and here this line sort of hints at that. But oh, how much my words miss my conception, my, my conception, which is itself so far from what I saw that to call it feeble would be rank deception. My words can't get there. My words are not enough. My words fail me, and they will fail you in describing this experience. But what does he go about doing immediately thereafter? Using words to describe the experience. O oh, light eternal, fixed in itself alone, by itself alone, from which itself loves and glows, self-knowing and self-known, that second aureola, which shone forth in thee, conceived as a reflection of the first, or which appeared so to my scrutiny. He's describing the vision of God in the, uh, the vision of God and Christ as one. The, uh, the by itself alone understood, uh, by which and which from itself loves and grows, knowing and self-known. That second aureola is Christ, uh, which shone forth in thee, conceived as a reflection of the first. This is all heavy Catholic Trinity stuff. God the Father, Trinity all in one, yada, yada, yada. Um, the, uh, the medieval explanations of this were... Uh, astounding in their complexity and to be perfectly honest I have no idea what they're talking about I'm sure good Catholics somewhere do I you know good for them um, I fixed or okay wait a minute seemed to itself of its own coloration to be painted with man's image painted with man's image interesting the image, not the thing itself. I fixed my eyes, eyes again, on that alone in rapturous contemplation. Now look at this. Like a geometer wholly dedicated to squaring the circle, but who cannot find, think as he may, the principle indicated, so did I study the supernal face. He's staring at the face of God. And he imagines himself as a geometer. 
a mathematician, somebody who does geometry. Now, geometry is considered the most perfect and abstract of the sciences in the medieval era because there's no such thing as a perfect circle or perfect shape, so you're dealing in these ideals, but you're measuring them. It is a mathematical enterprise. You are studying them. You are mastering them in a certain degree. Here, he's painting himself as mastering the face of God. And he's doing it kind of as an analogy. Like a geometer wholly dedicated to squaring the circle, but who cannot find, think as he may, the principle indicated. Meaning God laid out the principle. And now Dante is trying to come up and check his homework trying to reconstruct the equation that brings you reality. God is a mathematician. God designed the universe. God gave the structure and order to the universe. God did it with math. Math is logic. Math is order. Math is human. So did I study the supernal face. I yearn to know just how our image merges into that circle and how it there finds place. I yearned to know just how our image merges. Yearned to know. I want to know my place in the universe. I want to know the logic of my existence. I want to know the thought process that fixed me there. I want to know the mind of God. Now, I particularly like the phrase, I yearned to know, because this points directly through the Renaissance. We spoke about the Renaissance is the ability to see yourself as almost on God's level being able to stand with the full dignity of humanity behind you and challenge the logic and the order of the universe, or at least to know it. The Renaissance will be superseded in Europe by a period called the Enlightenment, where people tended to question everything even religion. And the impulse of the Renaissance, which I find seated here in the era of the medieval, that impulse drives people to reject God out of hand, or at least consider him out of the question. The prevailing uh, theology of the time in this particular culture of Europe was deism where you get God as the watchmaker. He shows up, he designs everything with the laws of the universe, he winds the clock to run on its own, and then he leaves it and goes off to deal with other stuff. And the universe functions on its own from then on. No intervention from God. And I look at that phrase, I yearn to know, and I hear the words of an Enlightenment philosopher, a German writing in Latin who said, sapere ode, dare to know, dare to know everything, dare to know the mind of God. That is the fulfillment of the promise Dante makes right here. I yearn to know just how our image merges into that circle and how it there finds place. Again, remember, this is somebody who was cast out of his own life, somebody who has suffered for years and tried to figure out what happened to me. And 
And here he is placing himself in the face of God and summoning the courage to say, what happened to me? Why? What's the logic? Why does the world make so little sense? But mine were not the wings for such a flight. Ultimately, it's unknowable, ineffable. Humanity can want to know. But here he's saying maybe we can't. I find it curious that here he singles himself out. Mine, not ours, not humanities. He's been very conscious of distinguishing between the personal, the collective, and the universal throughout this epic. Here he says mine. Like, I can't do it. I've done the best I can. This is it. Read my poem. Take that, and maybe you can figure it out next. Maybe you can pick up where I leave off. Maybe you can pick up the baton like Beatrice taking it from Virgil and moving on to the next step because there are limits in this world. And at certain points, you have to give up and cede your role to another in the greater organization of the universe. Yet, as I wished, the truth I wished for came cleaving my mind in a great flash of light. So just at that moment, just at that moment, when he recognizes his own limitations as an individual, That's when it's over. His image is gone. Here my powers rest from their high fantasy, but already I could feel my being being my being turned. Instinct and intellect balanced equally. I could feel my being turned. He is being passively turned, which is very unlike him. Throughout, he has been very conscious of laying out the effort of will to go on. Nothing happens to him that he doesn't want to happen. He makes choices. All of the sinners make choices. Contrapasso dictates that their punishment fit the crime. They chose a certain life while they were alive, and now a essence of that life is materialized in death. And so you get uh, thieves turning to lizards because they are animals at heart. You get uh, monks weighted down with leaden robes. You get uh, the lustful swept around in the wind. There is a logic to it. There is a willfulness to it. And this is the first time that I can see that Dante truly, truly says he didn't choose an action. I could feel my being turned. Instinct and intellect balanced equally. Suddenly, everything shifts into focus. He is being turned because he is being incorporated into this giant vision of reality this ultimate organization of the universe. He feels himself being clicked into place where everything suddenly makes sense. Instinct and intellect balanced equally. My animal instincts, my higher reasonings, all suddenly fit. All of the gaps, high and low, classical, Christian, Political, personal, universal, spiritual, practical, everything knits together at this point. It's an image of completeness. 
the first he's ever had. However lost he was at the beginning, wandering around before Virgil came across him, now suddenly he's locked into place. As in a wheel whose motion nothing jars. A wheel. Now, there have been a lot of wheels in here. I haven't really pointed them out, but wheels were very big in the medieval era. Wheels are a mechanism. Wheels show things going around. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, but it all works out because it's all even. Wheels are a tool. Wheels are a machine. He sees the universe as a well-ordered machine. And now the wheel is functioning balanced. A wheel whose motion nothing jars. Perfect synchronicity. By the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So we're back to the stars. The stars that point the goal of God's mind, the ultimate thought of divinity itself. The image anticipates the enlightenment pointing ahead. I think at this moment you get the sudden epiphany that he can't get there, but he's okay with that. And Maybe he thinks somebody else can pick it up. Now, he's writing this in the early 1300s. The Enlightenment is roughly early 1700s. Later, by the time it really picks up speed. But I see it as a continuum. I see it as... A culture growing through successive stages of self-consciousness. Just like the art we saw, the human portraits didn't look human because they weren't supposed to be. You're supposed to look at them and say, I don't know who that is. That's not a, anybody I recognize. Oh, yeah, it's the Son of God. I shouldn't feel like he looks like my cousin. Up through the Renaissance, when suddenly, yeah, they're recognizable, they're approachable, they're identifiable. I can see myself in them. They're not distant. They're not peeking at me from millions of light years away. Human beings find their dignity in this moment. They stand up and demand value. In each of these last lines, the portrait is not of the stars, but of Dante looking at the stars, of human beings recognizing that they too deserve recognition. Human beings saying that we have value. We have interior multiplicities that mirror God himself. And we can stay focused on the divine intellect, or we can focus back on our own intellect and see how that works and see what we can discover by focusing on ourselves because, damn it, we are worth it. We're not just animals. We're not just mouths chewing. We have value. Humanity deserves consideration. And that is what the Renaissance is all about, and that is the path Dante sets for humanity.